Great. Uh, thanks so much for, for inviting me and for letting me talk about um, some work that um, I uh, did with my former students, Rob Patro and Keith Dougal. Uh, don't worry, my talk's only 45 minutes long, so we'll have plenty of time for the break. Okay. All right, so uh, we all know that um, the amount of genomic data that is available is uh, huge and increasing really rapidly. And so just looking at one public database, the NIH uh, Sequencing Read Archive, it has over three petabases of uh, publicly available sequencing data comprising short read uh, sequencing experiments from you know, whole genome sequencing efforts, uh, metagenomic sequencing efforts, and many thousands, in fact, over 150,000 uh, gene expression experiments um, from R using RNA-seq. And the goal of, or one of the goals of my group is to develop computational techniques that enable fast discovery from data at uh, this scale. And in particular, uh, for this talk, I want to talk about uh, these gene expression experiments and the challenge of estimating gene expression abundance from RNA-seq data and, and doing that quickly and accurately. And so the computational problem here is um, um, there, in, in your sample, there exists some um, number of copies of uh, various isoforms of a gene. Okay, so here we, each one of these little blocks represents a different uh, isoform, and they're present in, certain, in uh, particular copy numbers or abundances. And the goal is to estimate the abundances of each of these transcripts given samplings of short reads from these expressed transcripts. So what you observe are these uh, short reads, and what you want to infer are these purple numbers. And that's the gene uh, expression quantification problem. And the challenge, and, and it's a hard problem because uh, first of all, this, as I mentioned, the scale of even a single experiment is, is large. There are hundreds of millions of reads typically in an experiment. Uh, finding the locations of the reads where this blue read actually matches a, a given transcript has traditionally been slow. And uh, the most sort of interesting computational challenges are that uh, alternative splicing creates some ambiguity about re where the reads came from. So in this situation, uh, this exon is present in two different um, isoforms, and so when we see a red read, we don't know whether it came from this isoform or this isoform. And what we would really want is isoform level quantification of these uh, abundances. And then finally, the sampling of reads is not uniform. There are sequence specific biases and position specific biases and uh, other uh, experimental biases that um, uh, cause the, the sampling not to be strictly uniform. And so the challenge here is to, in, or the problem is in the face of these challenges to estimate these abundances. Okay. Now, uh, um, in the past, people have argued that simple counting might be sufficient, but um, uh, for a long time people have known that these simple models of just treating a gene as the union of its exons or the intersection of the exons that are shared by all of its isoforms don't work. And they don't work for, for many reasons, some of which are, some of the most important of which are that they can't correct for, these simple models can't correct for positional biases or insert length distributions. And if you look at only the intersection of shared exons, you don't, you may throw away many, many reads. And this, the, the fact that these, that these simple models don't work and more sophisticated approaches are needed has been known for a long time. And that has led to um, a huge number of computational techniques that try to solve this inference problem I mentioned in a more sophisticated way. So one of the earliest was uh, cufflinks um, by Cole Trapno and, and in collaboration with Lior Pachter here, RSM uh, by Bo Lee, who is now here at Berkeley, Express by Roberts and Pachter, who is here at Berkeley, Sailfish by um, uh, one of my students and a collaborator at University of Maryland, and Callisto uh, by Bray et al., including Lior Pachter, who's here at Berkeley. So, uh, and unfortunately, I didn't have a chance to put the many, many other um, um, programs and ideas that have worked on this problem. There are far too many to list on a single SWAT slide, so I sort of biased the selection towards the ones that were, uh, had some connection to Berkeley. Um, <laughs> but anyway, it's a well-recognized uh, difficult problem, and uh, uh, our, our first effort in it was this um, method, um, Sailfish, Sailfish's um, key idea was to eliminate the um, step of uh, read alignment, which, as I mentioned, was typically very slow. 
So most of these other, or all the previous methods relied on starting with an alignment of the, the reads to the transcriptome, and then using that alignment as the basis for doing the inference. And this alignment step, uh, in terms of time, took a, a really long time. And what we argued in Sailfish was that you could replace this alignment step with something much simpler, really just counting k-mers that match uh, the reads and the transcriptome, and get uh, similar accuracy much, much quicker, more quickly. And what I want to talk about today is not sailfish, but uh, our subsequent work on improving both the speed and accuracy of sailfish in a, a method we call uh, salmon, uh, which you can read about here in a, a preprint. Okay. So as I mentioned, what we're trying to do is solve this inference problem. Uh, let me just define the, the, the main variables we're trying to, to infer. So in this, uh, um, in reality, we have some experimental mixture, which is a set of transcripts who, that exist in some uh, relative abundances that we don't know. And uh, say if we have six copies of the blue transcript and it has a particular length, say 100, then the amount of the number of nucleotides associated with that blue transcript is 600 nucleotides. And so what we can do is um, uh, talk about the percentage of the nucleotides that are present in the experimental sample, and that's called the nucleotide fraction. That's, in this case, 0 0.3, 0 0.6, and, and 0 0.1. And these are the quantities we want to infer from these short reads. And, you know, we can do the, the basically the standard thing and write this inference problem as a maximum likelihood uh, problem, where what we're trying to do is, um, uh, well, let me just tell you what the, the likelihood expression is first. So we have the probability of observing these particular um, fragments. Uh, I'm going to use the word fragment and reads pretty much interchangeably. These are our observations. Given the uh, nucleotide fractions, which we don't know, that's what we're trying to find, and the true read origins, which of course we don't know where the reads actually came from, but this, would, this encodes where the reads, which transcripts the reads were sampled from, and the transcript sequences, which we do know. We assume we know. So we can assume that the, the reads are all generated independently, and that just gets us this product of these probabilities. And then we can split up the, this probability into two parts, the part of selecting whether we sampled from a particular transcript, and that's dependent on the nucleotide fraction, the probability that if you threw a dart, you hit that transcript, times the probability that you generated this fragment given that you know you, you uh, generated it from that transcript. Okay, so and then we sum over all the possible transcripts to make this equal to that. Okay. So this is the, the likelihood model. And what we're trying to do is find the um, nucleotide fractions that uh, maximize this probability. Okay. Or, and uh, the interesting part of this, or one of the interesting parts of this, is this um, uh, expression here, the probability of observing this particular fragment or th this particular read given that we're sampling from this, uh, a given, a known transcript. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this term because it's one of the advantages of, of uh, the Salmon software. And I'm calling it in this talk, a bi the, that probability, the bias model. In the preprint, I think we call it an auxiliary model. It's called, I'm calling it a bias model because it doesn't depend on the um, nucleotide fractions. It only depends on the sequence of this transcript generating this um, read. Okay. And this term can take into account a lot of um, features about how likely it is that this um, fragment would, be, would come from this transcript. So for example, we can have a probability of uh, generating a fragment with this particular uh, length or, or insert length for paired end reads, the probability of the fragment starting at a particular position on the transcriptome, so this can take into account position-specific biases, the problem that the fragment comes was observed in a given orientation, in case you have a stranded RNA-seq protocol, and the probability that you see a particular alignment, so this can take into account um, matches and mismatches and insertions and deletions. Okay. So this... Uh, bias model encodes this, all of the features or the like, features of the likelihood that do not depend on the uh, nucleotide fraction. Okay. And uh, it accounts for these sample specific parameters and, and biases. And Salmon estimates these, uh, this auxiliary model, the, the bias model, from the data for each uh, term and every, every time you, you run it. 
So why is this model, bias model important? Well, as I said, I'm calling it a bias model, but it, it really can encode a lot of information about the origin of a fragment. For example, if over time you're observing the fragments, you learn, Salmon learns a, a fragment length distribution, an insert size distribution uh, that looks like this, then you would much prefer, you'd give a higher likelihood probability to uh, this um, location for that fragment than this location. So the bias model can, can provide a lot of information. All right, so that's, that's the, the likelihood model. The next step is um, uh, the inference procedure for actually finding the parameters that maximize that likelihood model. And uh, Salmon uses a two-phase uh, inference procedure. The first phase is an online inference procedure where it's, the reads are streaming through the, the, the program, uh, which is where the name Salmon comes from because Salmon swim upstream, and then this produces a set of initial abundances and equivalence classes and some auxiliary information, which is then refined in an offline inference uh, phase. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about each of these two um, inference procedures. The online uh, inference procedure um, is based on stochastic collapse variational Bayesian inference. And uh, it processes the fragments as they come in batches. And um, at a high level, what it does is compute for each batch a local estimate of the nucleotide fractions using the current uh, bias mo learned bias models and the um, current globally, global uh, nucleotide fraction parameters to allocate the reads. And then for each batch, after it finishes computing this local estimate, it updates the global estimate to get a new global estimate by adding in uh, some weighted version of this local estimate. Okay. And then it updates the bias model using the um, uh, fragments that it saw in that batch. Okay. Uh, because you're f updating these um, global parameters uh, frequently, in a traditional EM algorithm that wasn't streaming, you might um, run through all of your data, update your global parameters, and then run through all your data and update your global parameters. So you'd uh, only be updating global parameters once through an entire pass. Here, because you're updating your parameters more frequently, actually, in practice, this converges very quickly. And uh, because your each batch is basically independently processed, we can process each one of them in parallel. And we use the compare and swap um, instruction to um, do this without a lot of synchronization between uh, threads. So it gives us a very parallelizable um, algorithm. The other output of the uh, first phase is a reduced representation of the, of the, of the problem in the form of uh, equivalence classes of fragments. So we group together fragments that, uh, uh, whose al alignments indicate that they could have come from the same set of transcripts. So in this case, fragments one through four uh, um, have potential origins from transcripts one and two, so they get all put into uh, equivalence class one. And also, it, the, the, the other output of this online procedure, phase one, is uh, affinities that encode this bias probabilities um, sort of aggregated over all the fragments in this equivalence class, saying how likely is it that the fragments in this equivalence class came from uh, this transcript. And the advantage of this representation is that it's much smaller than the original problem in the space of the fragments. So now you're dealing with a space of transcripts and um, equivalence classes instead of uh, reads. So, for example, the, you know, in a, this is one particular set of experiments uh, where there were 116 million uh, paired end reads. You end up only with 100,000 equivalence classes. On, uh, and so, and the, the nice thing about these equivalence classes is that they, the number of them grows with the complexity of the transcriptome, not the size of your read uh, set, generally speaking. Carl? Yeah. So within an equivalence class, different reads may still have different probabilities to be generated from different transcripts in that yes. equivalence class. So how do you deal with this? Yes, actually, that's an excellent question. And um, the... The answer is that um, the uh, okay the on the online model we're optimizing the full 
model without any collapsing of these individual probabilities. And then in the offline model, we approximate these, um, these um, individual um, probabilities by the average probability over the fragments in the Empirically, this seems to work really well, but uh, it's true that the model might not be exactly the same. Okay, so we end up with this um, much smaller problem, and then we do kind of a very straightforward offline inference where don't worry about this equation. I just put it up here to have something to uh, point to. The, uh, we update the number, the, the number of reads assigned to each transcript um, iteratively by um, uh, assigning the reads in an equivalence class uh, proportional to the abundance of the, um, the current abundance of the transcript at times the affinity. Okay. And you just uh, repeatedly reallocate this until it converges. Okay, so that's the model, the inference procedure. There's one last missing piece, which is how we end up with these alignments. And um, the, um, the way um, Salmon does this is using lightweight alignment, where it replaces the need to get a full alignment of the reads to the transcriptome, like you might get from BWA or Bowtie, with instead something that doesn't give you the full details about the alignments, but can find the locations or putative locations of the, of the reads uh, quickly. And uh, the way this works is it uses um, maximal exact matches. So a maximal exact match between two sequences is um, a subsequence in one and a subsequence in another that exactly matches, so there's no mismatches or indels, and uh, the can't be extended on either side. Okay. And a super maximal exact match is a maximum max exact match that's not contained in any other uh, maximum exact match. So in this case, uh, maximum match ma mem2 here is a super maximal exact match, but mem1 is not. And so what Salmon does is, and these maximal exact matches and super maximal exact matches can be found um, really quickly. And so what uh, Salmon does is look for chains of these super maximal exact matches. So rather than try to compute an exact alignment, it finds these maximal exact matches and tries to chain them together, together in um, uh, allowing small um, gaps in between them. So we are looking for a um, delta consistent chain of maximal exact matches, where this delta means that the total differences in these gap lengths is bounded by delta. Okay. And so these chains can be uh, found quickly. And so you get you don't get the, the detail of an exact alignment, but you get um, a pretty good idea of where the, the read could have come from. Okay. All right, so looping back around to where I started, the challenges for solving this problem computationally were that finding the locations of the reads were slow. Salmon solves this by using lightweight alignment. Uh, it, the alternative splicing creates ambiguity about the reads, where the reads come from, so you don't know where, which, which isoform a read in a shared exon came from. So Salmon solves this using this two-phase inference algorithm. And uh, the sampling of the reads is not uniform, and so Salmon incorporates this sort of rich bias model that's learned from, from the data. And actually, I didn't have a chance to talk about um, all of Salmon. There's um, a lot more um, in the code base that, that I haven't mentioned. In fact, you can replace our this expectation maximization sort of traditional, max, I mean, the traditional maximum likelihood um, objective with a variational Bayes objective. You can provide your own alignments, called, that's called salmon align. So if you don't want to use the lightweight alignments, you can provide your own alignments. Uh, and this lightweight alignment uh, idea using the SMEMS was actually the first one we implemented. There are several others that are implemented now. So there are several fast alignment modes, not just the one uh, based on SMEM. And for details on those, you can see the uh, code and the preprint. Okay, so how well does it do? Uh, this is uh, simulated data with uh, um, uh, RNA-seq simulator called RSEM-SIM, a uh, human um, transcriptome. Uh, these, it's a histogram of uh, 
correlations the, uh, over uh, replicates. The uh, starred ones are different variations of salmon. The salmon colored one are, is the salmon that I talked about. Um, just now. You can see that uh, they're, you know, it's doing a good job recovering the, the known true abundances in this case because it's simulated data. And that holds up whether you use a different simulator. Uh, so here's with the flux sim and different organisms. So this is uh, ZMAs. You can see we're uh, getting uh, good accuracy. And under lots of different measures. And so in the interest of time, I won't go through all these different measures. But uh, I guess the one you're familiar with is the Spearman correlation. But these other ones look at the absolute relative difference and then the sort of covariance normalized by the variance. Uh, it's also really accurate when you have lots of um, isoforms. So if you segregate the genes by how many isoforms uh, they have, uh, you can see that um, salmon is doing a, a, a good job. Here, lower is better. This is the mean absolute relative difference. So we want to minimize the difference. And um, salmon's uh, able to maintain good accuracy um, even when there are a large number of isoforms. Uh, and uh, lastly, I, I want to mention this particular experiment, which I really have to thank uh, Mike Love, who did the experiment. So I can't take any, we can't take any credit for it, but it's an interesting um, uh, analysis. What they did was take um, 30 samples, all uh, RNA-seq samples, all from the same population and the same cell type. But the difference was 15 came from one, were sequenced in one uh, sequencing center, and 15 were sequenced in another sequencing center. Okay. And uh, there may be some real true variation between these samples, but we don't know what it is since um, they're actual biological samples. But you would expect that um, uh, that if you looked at the differential expression, be just if you separate, if you treat the con sequencing center as the condition, and you look at differential expression between the sequencing centers, you wouldn't see a, a very large amount of differential expression. So if you include a GC bias term in the differential in in the bias model of uh, salmon, what you get is a um, uh, relatively low compared to other tools number of uh, genes that are differentially expressed between centers. And if you remove this GC bias term, salmon's numbers start to look like all the other uh, tools numbers. And so that sort of indicates that this is probably closer to the truth of the <coughs> real amount of differential expression between these samples. But of course, we don't really know the, the truth. But it's some evidence that having a really good bias correction model can, in fact, improve your, or at least um, um, improve your differential expression uh, calls. And lastly, uh, salmon is, is uh, quite fast. It's actually faster than sailfish, whose main reason for existence was speed. Um, uh, but you know, to some extent, and I, sorry I don't have Callisto's numbers up here, but to some extent all of these things are fast now at this point. We, a few years ago, RNA-seq analysis was taking you know, six, ten hours per sample. Now uh, you know, salmon's taking five minutes per sample, and, and Callisto is, is uh, also very fast. So um, the um, sort of speed problem has been um, largely solved. OK, so uh, that's all I really wanted to say. Salmon, um, everybody should use it. It's open source. It has a vibrant user, user community. It's been uh, downloaded at least 1,700 times as of November. I don't know what the latest count is. Um, the, um, it's all uh, available open source, and um, it has a, a user group here. And so, again, I really have to acknowledge Rob Patrick, who did most of the uh, work on salmon, Geek Dougal, who did a lot of the um, running of the experiments and um, uh, working through the math, and uh, all of the um, funding agencies who uh, supported the work. That's it. Thanks. This and the uh, other comparison methods, they all assume that the reference transcriptome is more or less complete, right? Yeah. So if you spike in just some uh, transcripts that are not in the transcriptome and then compare the accuracy, have you done that? And what, what tool does better in that type of situation? You mean spike in to the, to the reference transcriptome transcripts that weren't, weren't there? No, or the, uh, the, the RNA-C. RNA yeah. 
some transcripts that, that were in the... Yeah, we have not done that. That's an excellent thing to do. I mean, um, we are, what we are trying to do now is extend this to work much better when your transcript, reference transcript is wrong. So that's the main line of future work. Uh, we haven't done that particular experiment, but yeah. When you said the GC model helped in the case of the two sequencing centers, were they using different technologies to do sequencing that would suggest the GC bias? So yeah, there I'm going to have to plead ignorance because I didn't I didn't do the thing. But I think that was the motivation. There was some motivation behind choosing GC as the separating bias thing. Yeah, but I don't know what it is, and I don't want to talk about other people's sequencing centers because, yeah. Think that uh, lightweight alignment is within a factor of two with exact alignment, right, from the previous plot? A factor of two in terms of time. In terms of time, yeah. Um, Losing all this information, we can have like all the information with exact alignment. Well, no. So this is, I, I, yeah, this is a horrible uh, plot because I think that this is five minutes versus a hundred and what's what sixteen hundred seconds. <laughs> I don't know. It's yeah. It's I think it, it might be log scale, but the um, the the um, you don't you lose that much inf information when you use the lightweight alignment. Okay, everybody uh, expecting talking now, so thank you very much.